So uh, I'm going to do a quick intro of our panelists, and then I will hand it over. Uh, sitting right here, we have my read. Uh, Bucken. So I've messed her name up probably five times already, and I've known her for about four minutes. Um, so I apologize. Uh, Boris Smoose from Google. Uh, we've got uh, Francois Doust, and then Matt uh, Carwana, or Carvana, who's going to uh, come and do our first intro. So I'm going to start by talking about something really simple. Um, it's just text input, which is probably one of the most fundamental kinds of input on the, on the web. Um, and I just think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned here, because um, th obviously we've, we've been using this kind of input for a long time, longer than we've had touch or anything like that. So w we've gone quite far towards standardizing it. And in the beginning, there were really only low-level events, like key down, key press, key up, that, that are very tied to the hardware. In, in a way, because of that, they're, they're really good. They allow us to attach special functionality to key, com to key combinations um, in web apps that should support them, wh where users need to be able to do things quickly. The problem is that they're not really suited um, to, to form and text-based inputs. They're too hardware-specific. Um, for a start, they have a lot of problems. For example, with, with non-Latin keyboards, um, like the Chinese keyboard, pressing the character key from, for man, for example, results in a key-down event with one character, which is an accented A, and a key up event with the actual character itself. So it's difficult to, to tell what the user actually wanted to input. And key events aren't just really difficult to use. Um, there are many kinds of text input that they, they just aren't designed to handle. And really, it's a mistake to assume that text input involves a keyboard. Um, speech dictation and drag and drop can, really, can also be used to input text. Um, the, the keyboard on Android has a, has a microphone button at the side, for example, which you can just press to dictate text into an input field. Um, uh, thankfully, no one has attempted to write a speech, speech dictation to key press event polyfill. Instead, there's another event that we can use, which is the input event. Um, it's been recently standardized in HTML5, and it's now supported by all major browsers. So th this makes it this makes it r really easy to um, to detect input in a in a hardware agnostic way. Um, key events are just a bit a bit too low level for most kinds of text input. We we don't really want to listen for physical key presses. Really, we just want to grab input. And the input event is a whole different way about thinking about this. We stop thinking in terms of hardware and start thinking in terms of intent. We just don't really care about the hardware at all. And that really, I think, makes more, more, much more sense than listening for key events. So why don't we take the lessons from text input and apply them to other forms, or to other forms of input, like pointing and touching? So take the anchor tag, for example. It can be clicked, touched, tabbed. Um, do we really? But, but do we really want to know if the user clicked it or touched it? Most of the time, we don't. We we just want to know if the if the user wanted to navigate to that link. Um, because there are fundamental problems with with listening only for click events on anchor tags. To what if the user tabbed to the link and then pressed the enter key, or what if the user issued a voice command and with intending to navigate to that link? Perhaps we can just have an activate event that we, that we can just use to listen for the intent itself. This can apply to, to command elements, buttons, um, as well as anchor tags. But at the same time, pointer, pointer events are still really useful. They're ideal in 2D drawing applications, and developers will rely on them to define custom, custom gestures for their applications. 
So those gestures can come from a trackpad, a touchscreen device, a Kinect or a leap motion device used in a 2D context. Um, to ask a common question, can touch, can touch events coexist with pointer events? Yes. Should they? Perhaps not. It's unlikely that a developer would want to capture touch events as a subset of pointer events. If you have access to pointer events, it's probably best just to use those. Besides, the, the, point, the pointer type attribute of, of a pointer event gives you access to the input device type, whether it's a mouse, pen, or touch. Um, the same point on coexistence goes for click events. Sorry, I've gone too, I've gone too far. Um, I think, in, in fact, that uh, developers will eventually get to abandon click events completely, and they'll be replaced by mo more semantically correct and hardware agnostic events in the cases that they're now most frequently used, like anchor tags and buttons. Um, libraries like pointer.js, for example, already make it possible to, to, move, uh, to move away from click events and move towards pointers, which are more abstract. Um, the trouble is that all, almost all forms of input we've discussed so far involve input in a, in a 2D space. Um, take Leap Motion's JavaScript API, for example. Um, you receive, you can receive input as an array of as an array of hands, and there can be anything from zero to infinity, really, because it depends on if you have multiple Leap Motion devi devices, you can just have an infinite, um, infinite amount of hands, and um, each hand has an x uh, has coordinates on x, y, and z. And how do we turn these into pointers? Pointers don't really give us a Z access, but it shouldn't really be, be that difficult to add it to the standard. Um, it, uh, leap, uh, hands from Leap Motion can, can fit into the pointer event spec. Um, but at the same time, uh, sorry. Just a second. Uh. So another bit, another big issue is um, is standardizing gestures, and uh, there's there isn't really much going on in um, in in this in this respect with with specs. Um, the, the closest we've come really towards standardizing gestures is the in the UI event spec, uh, which um, uh, sorry, which um, which which gives us a way to, to separate um, the the actual method of input or the the physical action that the user made from the intent. Uh, so, for example. Um, we, we, we can take a, a physical push action and turn it into an activate intent for a link, uh, which gives us a more, a more abstract way of dealing with input. Uh, and taking a swipe gesture, for example, on a, on a trackpad, we, the, in the UI event spec gives us a way to turn this into a, into a pan event, say. So, it doesn't matter whether whether the user provided the uh, provided the input using the speech API, say as a as a as a go left command, as a verbal command, or by swiping their hand on a touch screen, or by just moving your hand in the air to to mimic a swipe action. Uh, the, the spec gives us a way to translate this into a pan event, which we can then use to move a page around. So, really, in conclusion, we uh, we want to uh, we want developers to to produce more adaptive web apps. To do that, uh, we need to standardize um, input me input methods. Like we need browsers to support pointers. And um, it would also re help if we, if we standardize gestures. But at the same time, a probably more future-proof way is by providing developers with uh, 
more abstract ways of dealing with the, with the actions that the user intends, um, like activate actions for links, say, or panning actions for moving a page around. And in that, that will just make our, li our life a whole lot easier instead of um, requiring every developer to listen for all these different kinds of events for all, all different kinds of input methods, we can just listen for one event, which is the intent, and support that. <coughs> so, that's it. Thanks. Thank all right. So while I'm unlocking my computer so I can have a look at the questions, I know the first question that's on there, and it's like by far the most popular question is, what are the new input types that really, as developers, we need to start thinking about today, and what are the implications of using those? So I'd like to hear from all of you guys what you sort of think is the biggest and most important one, and what developers need to think. So, Myrid, do you want to go ahead? Uh, well, in, in terms of new biggest at the moment, I think, in terms of something that's not just keyboard or mouse is touch. That's the majority of your users are going to have that. If you're talking about things that you haven't really thought of that are coming in, may, maybe motion sensing, so maybe leap motion, because that's coming next, S should be released at the end of this month, allegedly. Um, but also, like um, Anna Debenham did loads of work into how many children are actually using um, games consoles, so anything that you can interact with a games console with, and also um, hybrid mobiles that are games console devices and mobiles. So they have joysticks and touch screens and maybe keyboards and, you know, so you've got to think about what application you're making and what that your users are likely to be using. Cool. Boris? Um, yeah, I would basically agree with that. Um, touch is, realistically speaking, the only interesting new mode, at least from the perspective of what we need to do as web developers. But there's a, a whole slew of emerging technology that I, I don't think Leap is at all extent, like the extent of what's coming. Um, there's a whole number of, pretty much every large corporation has some, some finger in this pie of like camera-based or something like this uh, input technologies. Uh, whether it's tracking fingers, hands, bodies, faces, irises, etc. So there's a whole number of primitives in the real world that are going to start to be tracked. And this is obviously a little further out, but still interesting. Um, so um, just to maybe add uh, uh, something more on top of the, the huge list you already mentioned, uh, maybe at the intent level that uh, Pete mentioned, uh, I would perhaps add a, a presence or a user attention as a, a possible way for a more immersive experience. For instance, if you have a screen that is displayed on a wall, uh, a mirror or something, something that is connected, uh, you might um, just uh, want to know whether the user is in front of it or whether whether it's not, and uh, the, the thing that you're going to display, the interaction with the user, will change based on that. Again, it's, the, it's at the intent level, so you don't need to know how this is, uh, uh, how the system knows that the user is there. They already have some uh, mechanisms to do that with the RFID, with the NFC, with the, uh, actually the user manually entering uh, his status on Skype or whatever, saying, I'm available, I'm busy, I'm not there. Uh, so it has full back, and that could be a, a new kind of a user input um, coming in in the near future. Um, I think that's. One of the most interesting developments in, in input is speech because it, it forces us to think of input in a whole new way. We suddenly de have to deal with a, with a method of input that doesn't involve fingers, doesn't involve hands, doesn't involve touching, moving, or anything like that. So we just have to completely change the way that we think about, think about input and write applications in different ways. Um, the first, the first step is to is to probably change standards or to develop develop new standards to to allow developers to, to more easily support this new form of input without relying on polyfills. Um, may, maybe I I tend to think that uh, providing polyfills is probably a good way of getting started. We we ca we can produce the polyfill get developers to start using it, and then eventually the, the standard will come later. 
So actually, that's a, a great sort of segue to the next question um, that Andrew had put in. Um, and his question was, if we use a mechanism for abstracting all directional input into pointer events, will we ultimately regret that decision? And I, I believe there's a pointer events polyfill library you could start playing with today. But are we going to regret that decision in six months, 12 months, maybe in 60 months? Uh, I'll take a stab at this. Um, so I think that there's some kinds of directional input that makes sense to try to abstract as a pointer, and other things that totally does not. So um, things that are screen-based is an obvious fit, where you have like a natural mapping to screen coordinates. This includes mouse and touch. But when you're talking about things like leap or any sort of sensing in the real world, I think you quickly fall into this weird place where it's unclear what the what the client X is, really. And at that point, you're dealing with physical units. Maybe you have some, uh, some Z coordinates. And you're just polluting this space. And I feel like it's a perilous path. So there's, I guess the, the short answer depends. All right. Anybody? Your only other choice is coding every single aspect from scratch. And are you, like, is your project going to be profitable? Have you really got the development time to do pointers and touch and click and keyboard, which I reckon probably most web developers are failing at already. Like, we're not even doing keyboard and click that well. So are you going to add another interaction paradigm into your development life cycle? But isn't the point of pointer events that you can sort of reduce the touch and the mouse and all that kind of stuff to one simple place? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a great idea. And I, I agree with um, Matt. You've got to abstract it. Otherwise, we're entering a world of pain. You've yeah. got to. Yeah, I think abstracting is important, but you still need to retain the ability of distinguishing between these different uh, types of input. Um, like, for example, you often do want to have like a touch-specific thing, which pointer events do let you do because you can distinguish between mouse and touch. But that's an important thing to carry over, so that we're still able to lose or still able to do these sorts of customizations. Yeah. So just to complete, it's again there are different la layers or different levels, and you want both of them, or uh, I don't know, maybe there is more than two, but uh, uh, you want actually the intent level for generic interaction, and you want the uh, uh, more precise level, the pointer uh, level being one, the touch uh, level being uh, a deeper one, maybe. And all of them are, have some use cases that need to be fulfilled. Uh, so it, the difficulty is uh, teaching the developer what to use and uh, how, to, how not to misuse, because if you mix the levels, you're going to end up breaking your app pretty quickly, I suppose. Yeah, and I think we've all seen lots of apps that have gotten a little bit broken with touch and, and that kind of thing. All right, well, let's go, right, go ahead. Quick, quick, quick a question for people in the audience. How many of you actually know what pointer events are? Just, just curious. Awesome. OK, so we actually are talking about something that like half the people don't seem to know what it is. OK, cool. So maybe just a quick uh, intro to pointer events. Basically, 30 seconds. It's, it's, Pointer events is a way to consolidate mouse and touch input into one type of event system. Um, the, the reason for this is touch events and mouse events are basically two completely separate systems. Um, there's this weird synthetic event concept where mouse events are generated for touch on mobile devices. So if you don't have a touch handler, you still get mouse events. But this leads to a whole bunch of problems. Um, so anyway, now that we're on the same page. Another quick question. How many of you actually have touch-specific handlers in your applications? OK, so maybe about half. Sounds good, thanks. Cool. Um, Myrod, I wanted to go to your question next. Um, do you think that devices lying about the event they are sending, i.e., uh, touch devices sending fake clicks, motion sensors that uh, likely motion faking a touch event, is unhelpful and someone somewhat reminiscent of browsers lying about their user agent? Um, so to kind of clarify this, what I was looking at the Leap Motion, and what it does is it, um, it projects a 2D plane in front of you. And when you touch that plane, it sends that as a touch event. So anything you've built to be touch related, a Leap Motion can do in 3D by pretending it has a 2D surface. But 
Like if you look at how a touch screen pretends that it's had a click and that doesn't really work, is the leap motion touch really going to be the same as you touching a surface? It's not, is it? It's, uh, so the more we end up down this dark path, and also like if you're doing feature detection, are you a touch device? Yes, I am. No, it's not. It's something else lying that it's a touch device. So that's... That's dangerous ground, I think, because what are you going to go back to user agent sniffing because your feature detection's not working? Like, I don't know, what's the answer to that? Um, one of the problems that we have right now is, in, in fact, is devices that support multiple input types, like uh, laptops with, with screens which you can touch, for example, but which also have a mouse connected. Uh, so. In, um, in, the, in the FT web app, we, we use a, a library called FT Scroller. But the, the issue that, that we have with scrolling right now is that uh, we, we feature detect. First, if the browser supports pointers, then if it supports touches, and then it, obviously we fall back to mouse events. Um, the, the problem is that of that with that is that we, we sacrifice um, usability. To, we, after we successfully feature detect touch events, it means that the user won't be able to use the mouse, for example, to scroll a, to scroll a layer. Um, what we should really be able to just use to just use pointer events, and it should should work for all the different inputs for the mouse or, or for the touch screen itself. Yeah. So on that point, I think it's important to for, for the case of a touch laptop, it's important not to just ignore mouse. You shouldn't, you should, maybe the best practice is to prevent default on touch events as opposed to not listening to mouse events at all. Um, since you can no longer assume that touch implies not mouse. Oh, and the, on the question of different kinds of input, reducing different kinds of input to different other kinds of input, I think uh, I agree with you. It, it, it's a dangerous path. Just like reducing mouse or reducing touch to mouse didn't work, reducing a leap which actually tracks um, it's a sausage tracker essentially it tracks sausages in the air, reducing that into a touch screen also doesn't work, and it it it's an insult to what leap can do. Just like reducing a, a touch screen to a mouse basically eliminates any possibility of multi-touch. Um, we have completely unexplored territory in in the 3D tracking space that we would just lose entirely. I want to uh, dive a little bit deeper into the interactions when using both touch and uh, mouse, because Boris, you showed me a couple demos yesterday where using a sort of having an object on screen, you could put your finger on it and then use the, the touchpad or your mouse to make it move. I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities there that haven't been explored. Let's talk about some of those different ones for, for a minute or so. Uh, OK, so uh, I guess there's a couple things that are interesting here. So the first one is just the transition between the two modes in like a Windows 8 touch laptop seems like there's some opportunity to have some almost like a responsive input type approach, where instead of adapting to screen size, you're adapting to input method. Um, just kind of throwing this idea out there. I, I haven't seen anyone do it well, but it's interesting. Uh, the other angle is multiple inputs simultaneously. So like what Pete was describing, with a trackpad and a simultaneous touch screen interaction. Again, these are, <laughs> I've built some prototypes around this stuff, but it's pretty early, and I think it would be cool to see more of them from other people and have a discussion about them. Uh, but it's a little too early, I think, to really All right. go That's into. Your answer. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? All right. Um, so the next question we have, uh, tapping links on a page incurs a 300 millisecond delay to work. Uh, to work out if the user's doing a double tap to zoom. Um, can we get rid of this delay somehow without losing the zoom? Um, in maintaining FastClick, which is uh, a polyfill that uh, we, we developed at the FT, 
um, to, get, to get rid of the delay, uh, we've dealt with a, a lot of issues. You will constantly bring up the issue that we've effectively disabled zooming um, by uh, firing a click event as soon as the finger leaves the screen, as soon as the, the touch end event is fired. Um, the, the issue seems to be that really we, could, we can't have the best of both worlds at the moment without, a, without, without an API that we can use to zoom the page when we detect a second tap. Um, but even in that case, really, because one, once the finger has left, left the screen, then you've already figured, then you've already fired the click event. So we, we, just could, we haven't figured out a way yet to get the best of both worlds. Uh, I guess, uh, unfortunately, the double tap uh, thing is uh, is really at the operating system level. I mean, it's something that the device brings, um, and you you cannot just uh, prevent it from happening um, uh, from within a, a web app, within a web browser, within this device. Uh, without, uh, I, I mean, we can't even imagine. Uh, I guess. Uh, an API that would uh, allow the web app to prevent the double tap because it's uh, it's a usability feature it's a, it has it has also accessibility uh, implications um, so it's um I guess the answer for me is, is no, you cannot right now. New devices will probably improve the touch interaction and maybe remove the double tap i don't know do you think that if, if we're bi building responsive layouts, then the users shouldn't really have to zoom in the first place. Uh, so, well, no, but I know I know that the uh, I mean I, I believe that they should be able to to zoom in, but I, I mean uh, I I know that it can trigger a lot of uh, uh, endless discussions uh, on uh, who's right and who's wrong. Uh, so I'm more uh, it's the same thing with the meta viewport when you disable. Uh, uh, scaling, uh, it's the same discussion somehow, uh, and it's uh, in my view, it's it's supposed to be uh, the user choosing whether he wants to zoom in or not. He may have good reasons to do that, but I, I mean, on mobile devices or tablet devices, it's hard to find a, a another uh, uh, interaction that could be used to zoom in. So it's um, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck. So when you develop web apps for customers, for instance, you will have to uh, make some workarounds and you will disable zoom in, even if you don't want to, just because the, otherwise the web app is not responsive enough. So we've had lots of discussions about this uh, particular thing. And I think this is an optimization that's either in the Chrome beta for Android or coming soon. Basically, if you have a non-user scalable page, there's no reason to have this click delay, so we just disable it. Um, th th basically, I think this is the way that things should be, and fast click is a giant hack that should never have existed. I mean, it, it, I'm not saying it's like a bad thing. Yeah, Clearly, I there was a completely. there was a need for it when there was a need for it, but it's time to get past that and fix our browsers. I don't know, like, if, why, why would you be loading a page, or can you guarantee that when a page is loaded that, that it's going to be Zoom disabled? Do you see what I mean? Like, even if you've made a responsive mobile site, a user still might want to zoom in on something. Like, is it, can you ever really make a, a web page that's... I would argue that yes, um, because if you look at native apps, basically, I mean, if we look at the extreme of ad adapting content to your device, then in the ideal case, we should be doing this. Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to, for special cases, and I'm not saying like disabled pinch zooming in general, or a double tap to zoom, but I think there are cases where it's justified. If we, if we had a pinch event, then really we could just listen for that and, and zoom when we get that event rather than uh, using double tap or anything like that. And pinch makes sense because you can theoretically, theoretically pinch with your hands if you're using a leap motion device, say. So it makes sense as an abstract gesture. Cool. Um, so as you guys were talking about that, I wrote down one, you know, sort of off the cuff idea is like, why can't we just put an attribute on elements and say, this element, if the user double taps on it, it doesn't, anything in here doesn't, uh, doesn't we don't get a zoom. 
And then you can just say, all right, great, everything in here, if the user touches on it, that's an immediate click. Was great idea. Microsoft implemented it in IE 10, or maybe IE 9. Um, there's a CSS property called MS Touch Action, I think, and you can configure exactly what happens when you touch this particular element um, to the extent of disabling particular gestures. So you can say, like, no, no uh, scrolling on this thing or no pinch zooming on it. Um, and I think it would be great to standardize this sort of thing, uh, just because declarative things are kind of better from many perspectives. So, yeah, that's my perspective. Cool. Do you know where it is in the uh, standardization process, or is it even there? As far as I know, it's not anywhere. Okay. All right. But I could be wrong. Rick? Sure. <coughs> Sorry, I'm Rick Byers. I'm the uh, Google uh, person on the Pointer Events Working Group. Um, and uh, so the question was uh, the, the ability to disable double tap to zoom with touch action, right? So touch action as we standardize it right now has pan, none, and auto, pan X, pan Y, none, and auto. Um, and double tap isn't in there in particular because it really only makes sense to talk about zooming individual elements, only makes sense in IE's concept of content zoomable, where you can have an element that's independently zoomable from the rest of the page. And so we debated adding some notion of zoom to touch action, but without a notion of content zoomable, it doesn't make any sense. All that really makes sense is the page itself being zoomable or not. And uh, so, so far in Chrome Desktop, for example, we don't have any zooming at all. Um, we're not going to add double tap because there's no way in hell we want to add that 300 millisecond delay in Chrome Desktop. And in Android, it's the viewport tag to disable double tap. That's where we are right now. But I think we'll, we'll you know, we've got to figure out how can we not delay the click um, while still permitting some, you know, certainly pinch we should still permit without disabling double tap. So I think maybe adding something to touch action is appropriate or some other mechanism. Anybody I don't know. Do? I kind of feel like, why don't we just ditch double tap? Like, is it really that much of a win? If you can pinch to zoom, do you need two ways to zoom? Not really. Like, is that? <laughs> we're not just filter that out. <laughs> Fix that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else have anything else they want to add on that one? Just as I agree. All right. <laughs> What do you guys think? Should should we just everybody take away double tap to uh, Zoom? No. 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 All right. Well, there we go. So it seems that the panelists disagree with you. Jake. All right. uh, can we get a mic? Well, we could. It, so it's quite often if I load a page on my phone that's not optimized for um, for the, the for the screen size. You know, it doesn't have a viewport meta tag. I'll quite often do the double tap thing, right, to to bring the paragraph to full full width, so I can so I can read it. But there's probably something we can do around that. Like, if it does have a viewport uh, tag, but it you know isn't fixed zoom. It, we could maybe, you know, when, when the user starts the interaction, we know that double tap's going to have no effect because the paragraph is already full width, and then we could take the shortcut there. We, we, you know, we, we, would, we would assume that one tap is click. We don't wait 300 milliseconds because double tap is, is probably not what they're going to do. Uh, there are also some touch devices that doesn't implement a multi-touch, so with the single input, the double tap solves the problem. That's uh, one point I wanted to raise as well. Uh, when we talk about input, we are actually entering a, a wonderful world of patterns and that kind of stuff, and it makes it hard actually to um, be able to do whatever you want. Um, and so, indeed, the uh, pinch uh, couldn't be done in previous version, at least of, uh, uh, of other uh, mobile devices, because of uh, obvious patterns. Uh, or maybe, maybe not obvious, actually. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, because of patterns. So there's uh, always this side of the story that we don't like to talk about and that we don't like as developers, but that still exists in this world. Right. But I think that... Oh, hello? Sure. Um, that's it. I think as developers, there's nothing that prevents us from implementing. <laughs> so obviously the, 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 the audio gods don't want Boris to speak. There we go. All right, let's try this again. So we, uh, I think the patents don't affect us in so much as web developers as like, we can implement our own 
gesture handlers. They're just not going to be available natively in, in platforms for any foreseeable future. But we can still, you know, make our own gesture libraries, and there's many of them out there. So that shouldn't be stopping any development in, in this direction. Yeah, what it stops usually is standardization. It's where things stop. And the gestures have been stopped uh, for that precise reason, uh, at W3C at least. Uh, there are other examples. All right, anything else? All right, let's uh, pop down to the next question. This is one that I added because I think it's a really important question uh, that gets addressed. But how can we, uh, as web developers, how can we test our sites um, if we don't own a touch PC or a touch laptop, right? How can we be testing our sites to see how they're going to interact on some of these things? Obviously, going down to the local like computer store and testing your website on, or web app on there and then going home isn't going to work. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, in, in my experience, the only way to develop, to test on a device is to have it in your hand. And if you really can't afford to do that, then I think you need to get testing labs or, you know, these kind of browser shop places where you've got someone else doing it with an actual device. Like, I haven't found any emulator or simulator that was really that useful. And even like if you're looking at something on a screen and you, you've got an iPad shaped thing, like our designers were designing things and then when the QA actually had an iPad in his hand, his thumb, the way he was holding the device, actually obscured part of the design, which you can't mimic unless you're really holding an actual thing. So mm -hmm. like I think if you can't afford every device and if you're a sole trader, you, you, there's no way you could do that. Um, you, you're gonna have to put an extra uh, line item in your budget yeah well I, uh, I'm afraid there's no many not many other solutions uh, we do a lot of developments on connected TVs for instance and if you can try uh, the emulators they, they just don't work as a, the, the, the the actual TV so you really have no other choice than to have the setup box the TV the whatever in your room and try it you can just delay the uh, time at which you start to try to, try to test the app on, a, uh, on an actual device, but it has, it has to be done, unfortunately. Um. Uh, at the EFT, we use a testing framework called Eggplant uh, to, to test using the iOS simulator, and um, it seems to work quite well. It's just uh, uh, very difficult to get using because you have to learn their scripting language, uh, script the device. It's very labor intensive. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning that the simplest thing you can do if you're, especially a site oriented or like a content oriented site, is you can enable touch events in uh, the Chrome developer tools. So it's just a tick box in the settings. And if your site doesn't work with those with that enabled, basically what it does is it creates a, a, a touch equivalent event for each mouse event. And if your site doesn't work there, then it's it, it's not guaranteed, or basically if it doesn't work there, it's guaranteed not to work on a mobile device. So you don't you don't have the opposite guarantee, but that that's it's, it's at least something. Um, the other thing is I would um, pardon my shameless plug, but basically there's a uh, GitHub repo that lets you uh, take your uh, multi-touch trackpad on your uh, Mac device and just essentially pass those events into the browser, synthesizing multi-touch touch events. If you want to check it out, it's called Magic Touch, and it'll work on your Mac. End of plug. Rick. Mike. Right. Coming up behind you. Behind you. There's just one more uh, really important piece I think I just wanted to mention that for, for this common case that uh, Matt was discussing about a site that uh, uh, when it's when you run it on a computer with touch and mouse, the mouse stops working. That, that's the case we see all the time on, on, in Chrome on touch enabled laptops. That's actually really easy to test. You can run Chrome with the flag dash dash enable or dash dash touch events colon enable or from about flags. You can turn that on. We really would like to have Chrome always support touch events. The problem is people conflate the idea, does the browser support touch events, with is there a touch screen attached? 
And in theory, we want the browser to always support touch events because you could plug in a USB touchscreen at any time. And we can't just suddenly start have windowed on on touch. We can't, we can't change whether or not the browser supports touch events during the lifetime of a renderer process. We can only do it on startup. Um, it would confuse the page even if we could do it. So um, we'd love to be able to just say, in fact, we've done it. I think for Chrome 22 for a while, we supported touch events. Everyone complained that sites were broken. We're like, yeah, it's because they assume that supporting touch events means that there's a touch screen attached when it doesn't. So please, turn that flag on. Run with it on all the time. It doesn't hurt anything, except it might break your site because you've got bugs in your site. So actually, on that, um, uh, it's sort of interesting when I think we're getting to a place where there's a lot of possible permutations of input that's available, and there's no real way to know what's actually hooked up. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one that's kind of hit hit this, but it, it seems like sort of a bigger issue for the web platform. Just yeah, I, no real point here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else we want to add to this? All right, let's, uh, let's pop down to the next question. And I think it's actually uh, going back to the sort of standardization comments that we've, ha we've had a couple of times. But should we start working on the standardizing of spatial and gestural input from the upcoming wave of 3D motion sensing devices like Leap Motion? Um, so I was talking to a research department at Kingston University and they deal with human computer interaction. So they've been working with like, you know, multi-million pound um, software and hardware to do human pose and gesture detection and they've written a couple of EU standards for um, gesture and also human body pose. So that kind of research has already existed, you know, not, not in the web development world, but in the HCI world for quite a long time. And like, if I was going to see a standard for us to work with Leap and Connect, I would like it to be following, you know, the, in the past of other people's research. Like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel for that kind of thing. Uh, I agree with that. For for most use cases, developers will just want to listen to the intent. For example, in the few use cases right now where a Leap Motion device is attached, we just want our website to continue working if we're listening for for events on link, say. Um, but for specific app for applications that are specifically uh, target uh, meant to be used with Leap Motion devices or the Kinect, say that then we really need. Um, a standard way of dealing with input from these devices. The, the, the market is probably going to grow. There are going to be many new devices. Uh, we, c we can't just ship all, all the different JavaScript libraries for every single device with our application. It's just not scalable. Yeah, I would sort of agree in spirit with the standardization idea, but I, I really do think it's early days for these kinds of inputs. And I think before standardizing it, it's worthwhile just to let a million flowers bloom and just to see sort of what the commonalities are and what the useful things are for, for standardization before we move in that path. Because it's going to slow us down. Matt, I want to I wanna go back to sort of on the same path of something that you said that kind of jogged uh, my mind and, and I thought was kind of interesting. Should we maybe think about with the pointer event spec just adding a Z coordinate to it? Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Why, why not really? Um, it, and, would, and would something like that work for Leap and all of these other <coughs> things? Potentially. It, it would work in a limited sense. Um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't allow you to make the best use of, of, uh, of the Leap Motion device, say. Um, but for, for doing basic things like manipulating something with it, like, like sets, let's say a graphic within a 3D plane, that, then that works. Um, for more complex gestures, then, then of course it would be a bit more difficult to use pointers in that sense. Would you need something a bit more sophisticated? Yep. I think um, 
the way I see it, there's a couple of different kinds of applications that you might want to use um, a 3D motion sensor device and the internet. So one kind of use case is that you're building a website that someone's going to browse. So they're swiping carousels and they're scrolling the page and that's quite traditional web development. Or there's another aspect where you might be doing something more in a 3D environment. So gaming and um, things where you need inertia and um, you know speed and like also uh, 3D motion does kind of tilt and rotation of a point so it's not just XYZ there's actually a lot of other information and that's relevant to a 3D world but it's not really relevant to someone browsing a web page or reading a magazine on their television you know so the it, what kind of application you're developing, it depends how much information you need so pointer is really good for websites and you know there's other things that would be relevant for other kinds yeah, I, I agree, and I would actually be wary of adding a Z coordinate to pointer events, um, partly just because uh, it's unclear what the units would be for all this stuff. You're breaking the you're breaking the connection of a, a mapping to a screen coordinate. Um, as soon as you're dealing with tracking real world stuff, it's in some different coordinate system. That's basically what, if you can bring it back to screen space you're doing it with some weird transform. But there's there's some other set of coordinates. Typically for a depth cam, it's uh, XYZ in millimeters, which would be very confusing to suddenly you know change your units to millimeters in pointer spec. So my vote for keeping pointers clean. Francois, do you want to weigh in on that one? All right. All right. Um, all right, so uh, pop down to our uh, next question. What will be the equivalent event for hover, mouse over, for touch devices? Uh, should we abandon the hover event when considering touch devices? I guess that, that could happen in the future. You could have some, uh, you can already do that, some kind of presence detection of the finger with uh, several systems, uh, infrared or uh, which is called ultrasound, or you, there, there are some systems that allow you to detect the presence of a, uh, of a finger without actually touching the screen, but it has more limited uh, use than the hover, and it's supposed that the, 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 the user is not sh uh, shaking and it's uh, actually pointing his finger correctly. So, uh, I mean, it's, we should not close the door to that possibility, but I don't think that's a main use case right now. I think it's important that we don't rely on hover for just the general web. Um, again, because of mixed modalities, possibly of input, I, if, if you rely on hover, generally touch devices are not going to be able to see whatever's there. It's a very clunky interaction to have this. I mean, you can activate the hover state, the CSS hover state, by doing this weird like action, like you, you press down on the link and then you move away from it before it long presses or something like that and then you get the hover state. Um, but obviously this is not something that we want to do or have people do. So I, I do think that it's important and though there's technology coming to, to make this happen, it's not going to happen tomorrow. So touch, you should be very aware of, of hover states and touch and don't do it. There was a comment back yeah. Actually, I asked that question, yes. And the, the reason I ask is, so my wife has a, a Samsung's note, which comes with pen. And pen, because it comes with pen, pen can do the uh, kind of hover equivalent. Like when it comes to close to the surface, it mimics as a hover. And also, when you do the uh, drawing and the stuff, something like Wacom, they also have that hover and it's very critical especially when you start doing day visualization or something you don't want to touch everything because you just want to glance the information then yeah you need a fine grained information which is not which I don't want to touch everything so I think it, hover is kind of getting neglected and the, it, yeah, especially in the touch you think like a touch panel enhances the input yeah. but it's actually one of the things it's de decreasing yep. yeah I, I think that's a really valid point I think it's kind of um, highlighting the problem of um, like our kind of, I don't want to use the word semantics, but I can't think of anything better. Like a hover on, with a mouse on a 2D screen is not really a hover at all. That's a mouse entering a bounded area. 
it's not hovering just above it because you've only got two dimensions. So, like, a, what what's a hover in a 3D world is different to a hover in a 2D world, and actually, it should be you know pointer enter before pointers activated. You know, and your active is your click, and your enter is your hover. But we need to move away from that kind of terminology because it's it is confusing. It's a mixed metaphor. So. I like cover, but I tell my designers they're not allowed to use it anymore. So. <laughs> All right. Um, we've got like time for, I think, one more question. Um, and so we'll go for this last one. Uh, smooth scrolling is critical for a good touch screen experience. What are some of the common pitfalls for introducing scroll jank to touch input? Um, so one of the common things people tend to do is uh, do a bunch of stuff in their input handlers. So this breaks down really quickly with multi-touch because you're having your mouse, your touch move events firing um, basically at a rate proportional to the number of fingers on your screen. So you end up having a flood of like, I don't know, something like, I've seen it go up to like 200, 200 FPS uh, touch input events. So if you're, if you're trying to render at 200 FPS, you're obviously going to be throttling your rendering uh, engine. So uh, the, the workaround to this is use request animation frame, set state in your input handler, and then render um, on render as opposed to on input. Anybody else got anything they want to add to that? Who's there? Uh, all right. Um, can we get a mic over there real quick? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is such a big problem, I can't help not speak up again. Um, I think people often don't realize the implication of putting a touch handler on your page. So if you're using touch events, the model is that the browser can't decide whether or not to scroll until it's dispatched the touch start or touch move event to you and waited to see if you're going to call prevent default. If you call prevent default on the touch start or touch move, that means you're canceling the scroll. And we might even be in the middle of the scroll and you prevent default to move and it means we have to cancel the scroll. Which means in modern browsers, we try to do as much scrolling as possible on the GPU thread. Right, which means we've got to block the GPU thread, synchronize with the main thread that might be in the middle of JavaScript or loading a page to wait to see if you're, what your touch handler is going to do before we can go back and undo scrolling. And it's a huge problem. So the key guidance I would give is what we've done in, in the recent versions of Chrome and what iOS does is it's got um, region tracking so that the GPU thread knows which regions of the page have a touch handler on it. So if you confine your touch handlers to just the elements that really need to have touch handlers, then we can only introduce the jank when you touch those. If you put a touch move handler on your document, it means that every single scroll has got a block on the main thread, and it's going to be almost impossible to have smooth scrolling. So just be, you know, this is one of the things I think is a problem with the touch vent model. Pointer event solves this. Um, there's a comment back there. Hi. It was uh, just related to what you were saying. How does that um, translate through to clicks? Is it just touch, or how, what happens when you've got the simulated clicks from the touch events with scrolling? Sorry, just to make sure I understand. What, what happens when you have simulated clicks? So if you've got a click handle on an element which you're using to scroll, does exactly the same thing apply, or is it just touch? It's, it's just touch handlers, right? Because click, click is triggered by a, a tap gesture, and so there's no ambiguity between scrolling and tapping. So you can have a cap handler, you can have a mouse down handler. Um, in theory, mouse wheel has the same problem. In theory, mouse wheels are blocked on JavaScript. If there's a JavaScript handler, we have to. But uh, I know all implement browser implementations today always block. They don't do the region tracking for mouse wheel because it's, there's a psychological effect. Scrolling with your finger, you really notice the drank. Scrolling with your mouse wheel or the trackpad, you don't notice it so much because you're not physically connected. So um, in theory, the problem exists for mouse wheel. And we said we're probably going to apply the same region tracking we've done for touch to mouse wheel and chrome. We just haven't done it yet because it's not as important because of that psychological effect. Um, so I, I know that the discussion has focused on touch and that the question mentioned touch explicitly, which is just wanted to uh, open it to another dimension, which is just a regular uh, nav down, nav right, nav left, nav, uh, nav up. Uh, events which are uh, the ones that you'll receive from uh, when the, the, the user is, uh, is using a TV remote, for instance, on a TV. And uh, it, has, uh, it makes scrolling actually uh, a bit of a pain because you have to handle it yourself in the, in the web app with the nav down 
and you have to um, well scroll the uh, the viewport obviously and then uh, also handle links in the good old days but the TV is a, is kind of huge screen as, com as opposed to the uh, mobile of uh, 2000 where you you had the keypad but uh, you had a small screen so it was kind of easy to make the uh, navigation so anyway uh, I just wanted to raise the point do not forget that there is more than a, a touch uh, and uh, my house. I, I think that's a great point, and I think the the performance tip there of, of really making sure that you're being aware of where you're putting your uh, touch events listeners and all that stuff is a really great uh, point to end on. Uh, so I want to thank the panelists for joining us uh, up on stage. I hope you guys learned something, uh, and it was uh, quite interesting for you. And uh, go build cool. <laughs>